Hello and welcome to another video here with me, Mioni. Potentially one of the last videos I'm going to do of 2018. Firstly, I would like to thank everyone who's been on this journey with me so far. 2018 was great for many reasons, but the biggest was the influx of new viewers, subscribers, and of course those of you who decided to either hit that join button or support via Patreon. It's all made making these videos a reality for me and proved that there is certainly interest in the style and format of the stuff I make. When it comes to 2019, it's my intention to work on better ways to display those who support me and find new ways to get people directly involved with the channel itself. So, as Yoshi P always says, please look forward to it. In general, however, the year has seen its fair share of Final Fantasy ups and downs, so I thought it would be a good idea to start a year's end list of what I personally found completely awful in the year, and also what I found finally fantastic. So without further ado, let's talk about my year in review. Firstly, one of the coolest things to happen in the world of Final Fantasy XIV news, in my opinion, has to be the FanFest announcements and the reactions there afterwards. This is both a positive and a negative point for a lot of different reasons for many people, but as a whole, the direct reaction to FanFest, most notably to Shadowbringer's teaser trailer, was incredible. The trailer provides just over three minutes of teaser footage with an incredibly kick-ass soundtrack which Soken himself was allowed to compose this time around in a distinctly more metal approach, definitely kicking the game into a completely different tone. I love it, it's one of the coolest 3 minute cinematics I've ever seen in a video game, and as much as I've made a breakdown on the trailer itself, I have to say what I got from the trailer compared to others was pretty base level and made me look quite idiotic. There's a lot of really intelligent people that picked up on a lot of stuff that I had missed, lore ties with the Amdapori and Kuribu was the main one, and much much more. But I think my hype in those videos was more than evident and honestly I couldn't hold back, I just wanted to make a video on it. I just need to refresh up on my lore the next time I do a video like that. Thankfully the new lore book will help me quite a bit. So the second thing on this list has to be a negative point, we're going positive, negative and so on. So I'm just going to bring up the terrible display of ethics when it came to Square Enix's PAL region contests this year. Specifically one of them was more annoying than the rest, the housing design contest. Much of the emboldened rules on the forum post at the top of the contest were said to be enforced and quite important. Yet when the reveal occurred as to who actually won, there were several glaring issues that point to towards an automated picking system and not a hands-on judging at all. Multiple wins for the same people occurred with the same names being drawn sometimes two or three times in a row, despite how it's account wide and the people winning three times with different entries all won all on the same account, can't trade the items nor can they actually redeem the items more than once. And that's just the most annoying issue. Most of the entries were violating other rules. Do not edit your screenshots, they asked, and people ran them through Photoshop and changed the hue and saturation of the game. Yet amongst the winning entries, these modified screens were listed as winners. It was all a complete shambles, and when I made that video earlier in the year, I lost a lot of respect for that side of the forum staff themselves. If you're actually going to list rules in bold, you should probably enforce them, and, you know, judge the entries personally with your staff, not just use a bot. But hey, this is why the EU forums are trash anyway. Third on my list is another positive one. After hearing that, you probably have to have some positivity, don't you? Patch 4.4 and specifically the end of the Omega Raid and the Omega Raid in general. The whole storyline with Omega has to be on my list as a positive as I felt that the Omega series, whilst I didn't get to raid much of the Savage content of it this time around, did seem like an incredible chapter to finish both the raid off mechanically and story-wise. Without getting into too much detail for people unaware of the storyline, the prospect of the final storyline with Alpha after the raid concludes actually made me cry. I don't know why to be honest but I sat there with many onions being cut around me and my eyes got very damp for some strange reason. The further prospect then of Alpha appearing in Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon Everybody next year on the Nintendo Switch 
makes me even more excited. Complete with Ironworks gear and the artwork, I, I really want to see what he gets up to next. In general, Omega was probably my favourite raid so far out of the eight-man raids themselves. Alexander was personally brilliant in my opinion, and Coil was intimidating, but I think that the variety of boss designs, the nostalgia, the mechanics, it all made a very cool sort of collage rather than a simple picture this time around. Seeing firsthand which new bosses they added to it, and then hearing Kefka's epic laugh and music introduction for example, yeah, I don't think that's going to be beaten for quite a while in my book. Fourth thing on the list then, and this one again has to be a negative, and this one is going to be simply performance for bards, the various updates of said function throughout the year. This really grinds my gear so to speak, or I guess in this instance toots my horn in a bad way. Adding performance to the game itself was a great thing in theory, the ability to play songs note by note with my own sausage fingers on my keyboard or controller, which some people got incredibly good at in a frighteningly quick pace, which I'm totally not jealous of by the way. But herein lies the rub. The policy agreement informs you that certain music tracks are prohibited to be replicated and played on the perform function in game, specifically the Answers theme, one of the biggest hits from 14, and a few of the other title tracks cannot be played in game, or at risk of your account being in danger of suspension or termination. Apparently people have been temporarily banned for playing themes in city states from other game series or other recognisable sources like TV themes. And when it comes to YouTube, I got a little excited to make videos of me playing since I actually love playing the in real life keyboard. But I myself had videos claimed worldwide by Square Enix for copyright infringement, and those were specifically not the prohibited songs they listed. It's on the list as a negative due to how weird it feels to me. You may or may not know, but I have videos on this channel a long time ago from a game called Arcage, where I played many potentially copyright infringing songs on in-game instruments using direct note paper in that game, i.e. the songs were played for me after I typed in the notes notes, which sound exactly like the source I was trying to copy, yet in Final Fantasy XIV's perform mode, where your only option is to actually play the keys yourself and show some degree of skill, people are being told off, and quite violently at that. It is what it is, and you may think differently about this completely, but as a whole, performance goes on this list because of these reasons, and made me completely lose interest and forget all about it. I really have nothing good to say about it in general, as I cannot currently use it on the channel without risk of an algorithm detecting my notation, and therefore, I think it's pretty crap. Fifth on the list, back to a positive side of things this year, the in-game events. Oh my god, they have been good this year. Despite what many people will say, arguing against me here, being upset about some of the events not having specific mounts and others having them, if you actually sit back and look at what we got this year, you might see things more positively. The rewards, be it glamour, mounts or minions and housing stuff were a lot more, well a lot more, from fancy outfits with moving sunglasses with the visor command and incredible limited time jumping puzzles, to J-pop-esque cheering emotes with a lit multicolored cheer stick, to heart seats from the Valentine's event, strange platform minigames where you control a spriggan to collect eggs for Easter, a fully fledged Monster Hunter World crossover event complete with normal mode 8 player, and a four man extreme fight against Raffalos himself with custom 14 style Raffalos gear, Palico and Poogie minions, a rising event where we got to see the Calamity in Uldar and reenact much of the battles around the city in 1.0's dying days with controversial earring rewards, the itinerant Moogle popping by to give us previous year's contest rewards such as the Scarf of Wondrous Wit and much more, All Saints Wake brought with it the ability to control popular NPCs from the main scenario storyline, and some awesome housing items, not to mention the ability to renew your marriage vows and make your own in-game events with a new minion reward, and recently the Starlight Festival which allowed you to basically play theatre of them to get some choir gear and other housing items along the way. The in-game events may or may not be your thing in this game, but you cannot deny that they are a far cry from the crap we used to have before Stormblood, where speaking generally as an in-game event was just picking up a quest, reading something, and then turning it in straight away for your reward. At least now we actually have to do things that can be construed as entertaining before we get the rewards themselves, and that is why it made the list. 
Sick from my list is PvP, and this is, as you might have guessed it, a negative for me personally. It's not that PvP itself isn't interesting to me, no, it's quite far from the fact. I just don't think the game is really capable of providing the PvP that a lot of people expect from it. The expectations versus what you get are generally the catch. But for me, the rewards and the iterations of the modes have been the issue this year. So I cannot really realistically queue for the feast within a realistic time frame. Sitting there for sometimes up to three hours at a go for a feast match during peak times in my country make for a pretty poor experience in general. Once you get into the PvP it feels clunky in my opinion and the fact I cannot coordinate with my team because Square Enix thinks I'm going to call someone's mother a llama or something in chat and so took the chat option away only really adds to what is already a bit of a crap experience. Instead having preset phrases to juggle around whilst you're trying to fight. Then you have Rival Wings, a mode that I really loved when it originally came out but then the queue times started to fall and everyone simultaneously begged Square Enix for a fix to the PvP queues and lo and behold no fix came. And now if you want to do rival wings for your gorilla mount or just to experience it, you have to take part in the Final Fantasy XIV unofficial subreddit Revival Wings project. I mean... Seriously, this was not a priority before announcing the new map. I'm sure the Gorge map will be excellent and likely with new rewards in 4.5, but how about you incentivize people to queue for the one we have already? Or, you know, make a random PvP queue to include rival wings. You have Seal Rock, etc. in Frontline Roulette, so why don't you just simply add it to that and rename it? And then, my friends, there are the rewards. Without getting too salty, as you know, I usually get and have to make a machinima to get it off my chest, chocobo chairs, housing design contest winners entries, towels, all of which strangely acquired by ludicrous amounts of wolf marks. To some extent I can understand some of the mounts perhaps, although I still hate how Aulus's chair is a reward from ranked PvP, considering it's based on a boss from PvE. So as you can see, my brain gets quite confused as to why they didn't, well, you know, add a version of it to that boss, at least, as well. Making it purely a PvP mount kind of sucked the fun out of it for me. There's a lot I personally find wrong with PvP, and a lot of it has been talked about by various members of this community at length, but hopefully 2019 can improve it in some way where I can actually do it. The lucky seventh number on this list is, in my opinion, the developer blogs and developer feedback. The amount of communication with the developers throughout their blogs, lodestone pages, and in general listening skills have been, for the most part, a lot better than 2017. We've seen a lot of cool additions, such as the Glam Addresser, and then subsequently communication with them on how best they can improve that feature, i.e. more storage for the love of all that is holy. And generally, a lot of quality of life changes came out of these blogs that only became apparent I needed them since Stormblood's release. Scaling windows and chat boxes, the ability to teleport to areas on your map easier with magnetic curses on a controller to the etherites, triple triad NPCs with different symbols to tell you if you've even fought them and won before or if they still have cards you need for your collection from them, item levels being displayed on food buffs to make them easier to find in your bags, performance having its own volume slider, the mailbox now works a lot better with split mail sources into separate bags. The list is absolutely enormous and gets bigger and bigger all the time, but Stormblood as a whole has added much more quality of life than I ever imagined. They are mostly so good that each time one is added it disappears in my mind almost instantly, as if it has always been there and my fingers snap into muscle memory, and for that reason alone, and the tons of dev blogs that talk about the features like this, show they are actually listening to quite a lot of community feedback and being quite original in their own answers to problems as well. Let's hope they continue to do this in 2019 and perhaps look at other areas of interest, especially PvP. Eighth on the list is Hildebrand. This is both a meh and a hmm from me. 
Hildebrand in Stormblood, for the most part, has been quite entertaining. Pretty good storyline for me personally, but the amount of content in each patch is devastatingly low. The first Stormblood iterations contained up to two quests at a time when they were added into their patches. So two quests, that's about 10 to 15 minutes of your time if you're a fast reader, running back and forth, no major rewards as of yet, and huge gaps between implementations of new chapters. Like I say, the storyline isn't actually too bad this time around and I've quite enjoyed it, but the small bits we get just aren't enough to make me want more of it. It's only recently when I heard about how in March we might be getting the Yojimbo trial that they featured for people who went to this year's FanFest in the game that my interest in Hildebrand suddenly peaked again. And all of the talk about trials returning to Hildebrand's storyline and the various rumours make my eyes positively light up. I loved Hildebrand in the first iterations I saw in this game. I loved the Ultros fight. I loved the battle on the big bridge theme being blasted at me whilst I fought against Gilgamesh and the stupidly hilarious green chicken Enkidu. So it's both a meh, it's kind of crap, as well as ooh, it could be about to get really good in my opinion. So it's kind of on the list for that reason alone. Ninth on the list and a positive one is definitely the Mog Station. The Mog Station you ask? How can the cash shop be good and good enough to put on this list? How can you possibly have this as a positive number? Well, for the sole reason alone that the whole thing isn't pay to win yet. A ton of people in our community seem to think that things are going pay to win. A bike with a speed boost for low levels is pay to win suddenly, or an outfit with plus two int on it is pay to win, or a level boost is pay to win. But really, as a whole, there is no gear on there, there's no weapons, there's no loot boxes, thankfully, there's no stupid stat potions or anything like that. What there is on there is cosmetic, overpriced, and full of its own flaws. Boost your character, boost the storyline. Sure, if that's what you want to do, do it, but that doesn't give you the experience, skill, level, or gear required to do savage raids nor anything relevant actually. Personally I've boosted my Dragoon amongst other classes. I will not be playing it as a main source of entertainment but I really couldn't be bothered to go through the 1 to 60 experience for the upteenth time. If I desired to play it in a group with others outside of my group of friends then guides would likely be read and trying it out on lesser stuff would be my priority before jumping in with others. But that again just saved me time. It, it didn't make me able to play the role effectively and I still have another 10 levels to get before even hitting max level, and then there's gearing. In short, I think people overreact way too often, and I think we should be thankful for the Mog Station how it currently is. Yeah, the prices are ridiculous and completely bizarre when you get an outfit for the same price as a really bad housing item or whatever, but I don't really see the wrong things on that shop yet, and for as long as it doesn't turn into Arcage, Black Desert, or any other famously pay-for-everything situation, then I'm actually quite happy personally. And for temp on the list, I would have usually made into a negative one, but honestly that's not how I want to end the year. Whilst there are a ton of positives and indeed negatives of the year that genuinely wouldn't fit into a format of a video like this, I have to say for the most part the year has been pretty damn good in Final Fantasy XIV. The real world? Well, that's a different story entirely. So this tenth point, a positive one, is you guys, my viewing audience. I said it at the start of the video, but without really expressing it properly, I don't think I can really get over how much of the year has changed my life. I went from a pretty depressing situation that I'm not going to talk about with pretty low prospects and a whole lot of other issues, to being able to make videos I genuinely love to create on a daily basis. And I think from what I've communicated with a lot of you so far, much of the problems I suffer, anxiety being a huge one, are only really overcome if you really throw yourself into the project you're working on. We all share our own difficulties, and I think when it comes to something you're passionate about, you can reach past a lot of those barriers, much more than you'd ever imagined. And whilst I still have huge self-confidence issues with anything public and real world, this whole thing is slowly helping to make my life a lot better. So when it comes to how thankful I actually am, you can be assured that every comment, every like, every subscriber is much more than just a generic number on a chart to me personally. It's the ability to see that, oh shit, this person actually liked something I made enough to press a button. And if you're again one of those people who went even further and had some spare money to give me this year through Patreon or the join button, 
then you have my sincerest thanks. So, thank you everyone. Seriously, if you've watched this until now, you are truly wonderful. And please enjoy your New Year's celebrations. Thank you kindly, one and all, for watching. Hopefully 2019 will be better for you personally. And I'll see you all next year.